All right, so for our after lunch talk, I know you guys have full bellies, but thank you for coming back here. Uh, this will be Wes talking about container security in containing the cloud. Thank you very much, guys. All right, now's when we need the applause track. All right, thanks guys for coming after lunch. Like I was saying, I'm not sure whether this was uh, delivered or not, but uh, I'll take it as a compliment. So container security, and one of the things that I want to put on here, I've delivered this talk a couple of times, but now I'm starting to move more towards the engineering um, view of containers. A um, little bit of background, I'm a cloud engineer at CrowdStrike, uh, basically a data janitor, and um, kind of obligated to say we're hiring, so that's who lets me come out to conferences like this and talk to you fine people. So if you're interested, if you uh, want to do big data um, in the security space as a vendor, let me know. Hit me up. Um, a little bit of background to this talk. Uh, earlier this year, CrowdStrike was deemed FedRAMP ready, and then even more recently, we are fully authorized to work in the federal space. And what that means for you, not just tooting our own horn, is that we used a lot of dockerization and containers to do that. And that includes a lot of auditing, a lot of like really like fine scrutiny of what's going on in, in a very low level. And that's actually the genesis for this talk because we wanted, to, we wanted to know what would it look like if our environment got compromised. And since we're a security provider for federal customers, um, they really want to know that too. So that that's kind of what drove all this. Um, some additional context is that we're um, using Kubernetes in Amazon's GovCloud region um, for a security application for customers. And it's um, for a lot of security conscious organizations. So they want to know all the way down to like what would an attack profile look like, all that. Um, now, the bearing that that has on most other companies is that there's a lot of, there's polling that shows that the primary reason, that companies want to move to containers, but they're concerned about what the security posture would look like because containers kind of be, or kind of seem to be black boxes. Um, and I'm coming at the, con, at the question of container security more from a systems engineer perspective. We do about 200 billion events per day. And that's uh, like 16 terabytes in, uh, every six hours or something like that an enormous amount of data. So that'll come into play later, but performance and security aren't, um, both of those have to be considered at the same time at, at a really high volume. So first, I think it's helpful to step back and ask, what are containers? Because not everybody has had experience with containers. How many of you guys have worked with containers? Or this guy has. How many of you are using containers in production? You? Um, are you using an orchestration utility for Kubernetes? Okay. A lot of different orchestration flavors? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, so, um, right. <laughs> my, my, so that, that reminds me of my introduction to containers. It was uh, working with a company where we had a web app and I was on call and I got tired of being paged because the app would just fall over. It was a Scala web application. And I really didn't care what the exception was. Some engineer wrote something that didn't deserialize properly, whatever, didn't care. Wrapped it in a container and deployed that just on the host itself with a restart always flag. And that was my beginning of my Docker experience. Generally what happens is, so containers um, are kind of an overloaded term here. There's iOS, Android, OS 10, Windows. There's, there's all kinds of containers. What I'm going to talk about is containers as application deployment. So the most, uh, anybody ever seen this XKCD comic? I don't know that you can actually read it there. But the key point is most people are introduced to containers um, from the sense of I want to go play with this application. Let me go look on Docker Hub, pull something down. It's running real fast and I can just work with it. It's almost like magic. Now there's pros and cons to that. The pro is you can get working on it really easy. The con is, um, could be anybody's code. Could be anything in there. So software development lifecycle. The simplest way to deploy an application is just a binary. 
Just push that over. So Facebook had the famous like what two gig binary that they pushed out that had their entire app code. I don't know if that's still, still the same. Um, but generally, you want to rely on other pieces of software, other libraries, and this is where it starts getting hairy. So then we need to track down all of these deploy or all these dependencies to make our applications repeatable in each environment. And the problem is, once I start depending on other applications, then I'm not really sure what, I have to track their versions, I have to trust them to make sure that they're actually using um, Simver properly, um, that they're actually not overriding versions with newer versions or anything like that. So there's uh, peculiarities and they, they're calls for a really complex deployment system. So containerization from the Docker sense is I want to freeze dry everything and deploy it all together, all the dependencies, system dependencies, everything, so that I know exactly when I go to deploy an image in Integ and it passes all my checks, that exact same code is going to be running in production. There's no, there's no weirdness that goes on with a library getting swapped out or something like that. So some of our other deployment options, besides containers, are virtual machines. And we could deploy a, an artifact, like an entire machine, as an image. And this is basically where the cloud 1.0 took off, right? Where we, we started baking everything into uh, AMIs, or virtual machines with um, VMware, or something like that. The problem, though, is they're really heavy and they're slow. And they are, um, so containers are deployments of virtual virtual machines. In other words, they don't virtualize all the hardware, it's just from the kernel down, so the libraries. In fact, running a container is just running a process with a few caveats to it. So one of the interesting things here is that the attack surface, if you're deploying an application on bare metal, it's pretty much the most secure because it's got its own dedicated hardware, everything. VM architecture is more secure than container architecture, and you can kind of see here why. The, um, there's no hypervisor between the container and the host OS. This is one thing that's like really needs to be brought out um, in understanding containers. You lose some security because the hypervisor provides a lot of security. So here's another, um, um, here's another example. There's been 12 VM escapes up until 2017 when I pulled this stuff. Um, and a lot of these are for really silly things like floppy disk controllers and, and other like VGA drivers, things that you shouldn't have installed in your VM anyway, right? By comparison, the attack surface for the container is the kernel. The kernel has a lot more vulnerabilities to it, like almost 2,000 vulnerabilities up to 2017. Now, that means we've got a lot wider of an attack surface here. So, containers are separated um, by C groups and namespaces. It's really just a convenience function. It's not for security. Containers kind of have a connotation that they're going to contain the application, but they don't. Unless it's um, BSD jails, which was a similar concept and executed probably a, with a lot more security in mind, containers on Linux are really just I want to treat this group of processes as one unit so that I can track all of their memory consumption, CPU consumption, all of that in its own like virtual namespace. And then I can apply things to it like re-nicing an entire group of processes um, at a time rather than hunting down all the dependencies. So um, another issue with containers is when you freeze dry your entire application and all the libraries, you freeze dry all of the um, vulnerabilities in those libraries as well. So if you're running a Python application and it pulled in um, what was Flask, I think Flask had a vulnerability recently, then you have that vulnerability and all, every time you go to deploy that, app, that, that image, it's always going to have that vulnerability baked in. So you need to scan, track and scan both the base image as well as the application libraries. I would argue that container security starts with creating the container itself. It starts, so the way that a container, and I use container and image um, interchangeably, that's, that's my problem, but technically you're creating an image, and the image that you create is built up by layers. Um, specifically, there's a copy on write system. 
So every operation from your Docker file, every operation is creating a new layer. And not entirely, but it is. Um, so your command, when you're running things, when you're copying things into your, your image, they're creating a bunch of new layers, and what Docker will do is at the end of the Docker file, it'll squash those down if it can, and here's the layer of that image. Ideally, as a software engineer, my application code would just be, or an, an update to my application would be one layer change. So what we can do is we can have a common base layer that all of our applications use, and they have things like common users, common libraries, common all that other stuff. And that'll be important later as we get into uh, how that fits into the software development lifecycle. So security from the from base image. And Docker allows multiple multi-stage builds, so you can actually pull in lots of different images and pull piece, parts and pieces out of them. But the very last from is where your image is going to run. So one thing we need to do is, is make sure that our from image is trusted. So there was a, I forget the company, but they did an analysis of all the, um, all the base images on Docker Hub. And a lot of them had, or a lot of images have vulnerabilities, but the trusted official versions don't. So there's been continuous active scanning of the official base images on Docker Hub, and then there's a lot of other places that, that do that. So pay close attention to who you're pulling the from image from. Um, Docker used to have this thing where anybody could just push the binaries up there and pull them down. Since then, they've gotten to where it has a star if it's an automated build, and you can go inspect the Docker um, file that it was built from and, and all this other stuff. Best practices, pull the, the Docker file that the person provided, build it, build it yourself on premise. That way you know that there's nothing in there. Another thing with uh, Docker containers, that it, the IDs for the containers used to, be, um, used to be arbitrary. Now they're the SHA-256 of the contents of that image. Very similar, almost exactly similar to, get, uh, to the Git hashes when you're making new commits. That means that you have cryptographic certainty of what's in the image, given knowing the, um, yeah. If I, I know that if my hash matches over here, then the contents are gonna be exactly byte for byte the same over here. One thing to point out too is that in Docker containers, everything that you write in your Docker file shows up in the history of that container. So one of the things we did at CrowdStrike is we released, um, are the first uh, machine learning antivirus to VirusTotal. And this was one of our first Docker efforts. And this was an interesting case because we were gonna take that image and we were gonna give it to VirusTotal. And while we like the guys at VirusTotal, we don't trust them. Like, like anybody shouldn't trust the other person that you're handing stuff to. So what we would do is we would take our image, export it, and re-import it to get rid of all the history, all of the, the Git history. Even with that, one thing that we, that we really have to pay attention to is not putting our secrets in our build scripts because that output shows up in logs and it also may in, intentionally get freeze dried into the image. This is something that Bit, um, uh, I think it was Git or GitLab, one of those companies recently, they, they actually had their secrets baked into the history of the images that they were building. Um, so this, this stuff happens. One thing that I like to do is to use labels in the image and then put like the git hash that it was built from, the user that did it, like all kinds of auditing information that I just like to keep in there so that if somebody, something breaks, then I can look and see what that meta information is and kind of be able to track it back to something. Um, last thing is the builder pattern or multi-stage pattern. Um, there's a temptation, at least in the early days of Docker, to take your image, build whatever you were gonna build in that image, and then leave all of your build tools in the image. The idea here is if we use different stages or different um, one image to build our application, another image for the final release of it, we, don't, we make it a lot harder for attackers to live off the land. One of the, uh, one of the Core Engineers at Red Hat has this great talk that's basically containers don't contain. 
And if there's nothing else that you take from this, understand that containers aren't inherently secure. So root, uh, things like root in a container doesn't map to root on the host, but it's still problematic. There's still, and the problem there is file ownership. The UID in the container and the UID outside the container don't match, but it, it's gonna pick some arbitrary value. So for that, um, file ownership between guest and host is really terrible. Um, so if you, if you have to do it, do it as read only. Um, I would say that you should architect your applications to not use it at all. And also, um, yeah, a tight coupling between host and the guest is a code smell. So try to make it to where your application reaches out to some um, like S3 bucket or something like that for configuration information. So containers do provide a minimal protection to the host operating system. Um, they're not architected to be secure, but they do drop some privileges, which we'll get to in a second. So here's some quick wins that we can get. We can disable 32-bit compatibility mode in the kernel, and that cuts our attack surface in half. If you go back and if we look at some of the uh, kernel vulnerabilities, a lot of it is because in 32, or a lot of the vulnerabilities in the kernel are from 32-bit mode um, drivers or, or system calls that are just neglected. And a lot of the exploits, like the, the very last session in here, one of the ROP exploits that I found was 32-bit, forcing it into 32-bit mode, because that's often neglected. Um, so if we cut that, if we turn that off in the kernel, then we cut our attack surface in half. And if we mark our container as read only, then we make it a lot harder for, for any attacker to live off the land. Not impossible, but a lot harder. Because then they can't like pop a shell in the container and just start downloading tools and, and using that. <coughs> So another uh, tactic that we use is to recycle containers often. This makes it even harder to live off the land because if we're recycling containers, we can also recycle certificates that those containers are using. And we can make it, uh, we make it a moving target at that point. Um, sorry, I repeated the root thing. <laughs> um, also repeated some of the others. Oh, the last two points here, I guess I needed to make those a lot darker. There's a concept that's emerging in the container world of applying microservice architecture to the application. So containers really um, fit well with a segmented application that does lots of different things like reading, like you break up a distributed application and each little component is its own service and they all work together. The, the containerization or Applying that to container security is grouping those um, functions, not just by what they do, but by what access they need to do what they're doing. Does that make sense? So if an application needs to read from a, like most of them need to read from a network socket, but like reading a file or writing a file or doing like device operations or something like that, if we can turn off the kernel capabilities on this container over here, then we can like really shrink that application, what it needs, its capabilities, really far down. So we're applying capability-based security to the container or to, the, um, to our application architecture. What that would look like is as you go to architect your application, not only are you asking what, what component needs to be split out so that it can be scaled independently, but also what is that component doing? And one thing that you can ask as an architect is, how much, how many, what, what's the diversity of the, the different system calls that this application needs? And can I cut that down? Especially system calls that are very risky, like does it need um, lower level privileges to do like a ping or a, um, something else from the container? Can I abstract that away? Can I do health checks in a different container and so that that container has its own set of privileges? You know? Um, can I cut out file access altogether? Does my application just not need to read files? Could I have some other container that's in charge of reading files and it just provides like a network connection to another to a set of other containers so that we don't have every container reading off the disk? <clears throat> 
stuff like that. Um, I believe, or I view containers as a unique opportunity. So security is usually bolted on after the fact, or traditionally it has been bolted on after the fact for, um, for applications. But as we get more and more into containerization, we can move security into our software development lifecycle. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes. It's on uh, the healthcare.gov tech surge. Do y'all remember healthcare.gov when it was first launched? Remember what happened? It fell over. So they went and they went, or they went and they asked um, several tech um, titans to, to weigh in on what they would do. And Bill Higgins has a great talk on this. His suggestion was to tell President Obama that the team should deploy to production every day. And the reason for that is that it smokes out a lot of bad practices in your development. If your application is really cumbersome and you have to do all these things. So at CrowdStrike, when we went to go wrap our cloud up and put it into another place, we learned a lot about shortcuts that have been taken. And so we had to go back and fix those. Those are just good things to fix in general. This is part application security. Going back, making your application configurable, making sure that you don't assume things about your environment, writing your application so that it reaches out and asks the environment where it's at. So great example recently is that we were, uh, we were passing in like region information for AWS. Now we just go and ask what region this thing is in and then use that instead of having it configurable. So, there's a lot of great practices that come from trying to shorten that development or deployment cycle. So I would say continuous deployment, it's also facilitating continuous security. Um, it, the way to move security forward is with the DevOps tooling. How many of you guys are familiar with DevOps? Um, continuous integration, continuous deployment. So one of the things one of the promises of containerization is that we can wrap up lots of different tools and put those in, in different pieces of the pipeline. And I'll show you guys how to do that in just a second. Um, and all of these are their own indi individual tools. And if we can make our um, deployment pipeline pluggable, plug and play, then we can add security tooling as we go along, transparent to the developer, but also in a way that we can tell the developer like, how to do things in the best possible way. So that it's not like after the fact where you're doing a pen test or an audit and somebody comes along and they're like, you know, the way that you were writing your application all along was really awful. And then you have to rip all these things out. If it's baked into the, the deployment pipeline, you get immediate feedback of, of whether you're doing um, good things or not. For example, one thing that I've been really excited about recently is using various linting tools. So. There's linting for Docker, uh, Docker files themselves. There's also linting for the, the final outcome of the image. You can lint through that and see what's going on in the image, like what your startup scripts look like, things like that. Um, the bash that you would write in your Docker file, that can be linted. Everything can be linted. And one of my, uh, one of my friends, Chris uh, Sanders, has this great um, talk on security and nudges. He has this interesting like psychology applied to security practices. In fact, there's a book, um, Nudge, which is about setting defaults. So as security engineers or as security professionals, if we add good linting tools to the development pipeline, we can help developers write more secure code, not by um, coming after the fact and being a nuisance, but helping out, like we can write our linting tools to say, you probably should um, go ahead and close this file or write the close handle here, you know, as you're, as you're writing everything. So what that looks like is, as code's checked in to Git, it goes through the build pipeline, and then um, all of our linting and everything is done there, and then through uh, deployment. That's not really a useful slide. Um, so, Automated security tooling. In 2017, 24% of images in public re repository had high vulnerabilities. And yeah, this goes back to the freeze drying. Okay. Uh, trusted registries. Docker has a trusted registry. Google does too. 
where they continually scan images at check-in time. And they also scan it at rest because an image that's in the registry could develop a vulnerability or, or one of the libraries is known to have a vulnerability later. So like I was saying earlier, your image has a hash. All the layers under it have their own hash. And so if you're continually scanning it or scanning your images, you can say this layer has a vulnerable version of, um, uh, I don't know, some Python library. And then you can go and say every image that has that common image in it is also vulnerable. So I encourage you to look at things like uh, goharbor.io. That's a um, registry system that includes trusted registry. It also includes continuous um, uh, scanning before you promote the image to another uh, registry. And then you can also blacklist images, pull those back out of the registry, and say this image can't be deployed because it's no longer trusted, because we know that there's a vulnerable um, hash in it. So all of this is before we ever run the image. This is just building the image, how we construct it, how we think about it, how we pull out our um, kernel like syscalls, how we limit just the image that's running to where it's just our code. The next thing that we can do is we can uh, protect our applications as they're running. So Docker drops a number of, of permissions or capabilities by default. So, and there's a great doc on that, but it, it drops like, um, not file-based permissions, but it drops a lot of like other root and extended per permissions. So there's two profiles that we can use, AppArmor or SC Linux. And one of the problems with this is that neither one of them is blessed by the Container Native Compute um, Foundation. And also one of them was recently public atta publicly attacked by the creator of Linux himself, or creator of Linux, Linus. He went after the uh, App Armor guys. Google has um, GVisor, which if you remember back to the slide on what the applications depend on, GVisor basically adds in an artificial hypervisor into the um, container uh, ecosystem. I've heard rumor that there's going to be other attempts at a hypervisor shim that allows for you to set policies at the hypervisor level. So GVisor, until then, GVisor is, is an option. Um, I think it's headed in the right direction. Another thing that you can do is trace your application, and there are tools to do this. Trace your application as it's running to see what syscalls it's actually using. And then you can create either an app arm or SE Linux or just drop capabilities that your app doesn't need. That makes it even harder for someone to compromise your container because even if they popped a shell in the container, which they shouldn't because you're not baking in a shell in your container in the first place, but even if they were to get something running in your container, they're not able to do something outside of what that container normally does, such as reading a network socket directly or something like that. So uh, that kind of ties into the drop dropping capabilities as early as possible. So one thing, I mentioned it before, turning continuous integration into continuous security. So the new hotness is to use Docker to build, uh, Docker to build Docker on Kubernetes. So Docker on Docker, using Docker, like, like it's this entire um, turtles all the way down. So the way that this works is you use a Jenkins file. How many of you guys use Jenkins? Anybody? Um, anybody use Bamboo? How many of you are familiar with Jenkins? Okay. So Jenkins just basically a, a tool for running something like with multiple steps, like here's my recipe or whatever. Um, so a, using a Jenkins file, what you're doing is following the practice of treating your configuration or your how you build your application as another layer of code. And this is where a lot of uh, what you were mentioning earlier, you've got a lot of uh, a diverse ecosystem of containers. It's probably because uh, a lot of companies start this way, that, that you, um, you don't properly respect the fact that you're creating code. All the configuration is code itself, right? And so then there's, there's, there's usually got to be this big push to say, no, let's split this stuff out into its own repository and treat it as code. 
And one of those things that needs to be treated as code is the Jenkins configuration itself. So I've been a big proponent now of, of moving things into Jenkins files which can be tracked as code rather than clicking into the Jenkins um, master and writing out your steps there in the script field. But one thing we can do with, or with uh, Jenkins files is set up a staged Docker build. Each one of these stages can invoke a Docker image as a build agent. That means Docker files, uh, that means your build is now Dockerized and can itself be swapped out once you find vulnerable things or you want to upgrade something. This is where your security tooling fits in. Security tooling ends up being a stage. So linting ends up being a stage. You can have as much linting as you want in there. Well, it's not exactly free, but it's mostly free. And then as a security engineer, you can come in and write your security piece as either a pre-linting or a post-linting check. And if it fails, it fails the entire build, right? And then you can also write your, your tool to be really nice to tell the, to tell the uh, developer why it, it failed. And that's what you should do as a nice security person, not just leaving them hanging. Um, we've had great success with this across the company. So that rather than telling every team, no, you have to develop it our way, um, go do it however you want, but it's gonna go through our checks and they're gonna be mandatory checks and we'll provide you with feedback and eventually we'll get into this secure state. It goes back into, so the whole thing about continuous integration is as the, um, as the plane is flying, we're swapping the engine out, right? Which is a scary prospect if you haven't built for it. Going back to the quote from healthcare.gov, we're continuously moving and hopefully improving. So, automated security tooling. Uh, we covered all that earlier. Um, but I really like that image. <laughs> Basically, x-ray into the container. Um, mentioned that earlier too, the OCI spec doesn't include, uh, oh, it, it, it does include the file layout and the runtime spec, it doesn't specify a security model. So that app armor and SE Linux profile it's not included in the open container initiative. That's because they haven't figured out which one they're gonna go with or either. I have a feeling it's not gonna be either. And the reason for that, so the, the, the bodies or the uh, standardization bodies that you should follow are contain, oh, what is it? cloud native compute foundation and then the open container initiative. Open container initiative will allows for either run, well run C I think is their official um, running a container. Docker is the one everybody knows because you start with it, something that you can get running on your system really fast. But the Docker foundation is not something that a lot of companies really like being tied to. So the OCI was put together and it has Docker as a member but it also has Red Hat and CoreOS as members and Google and, and all these other places. And that's why I say their spec doesn't specify a security model. Now, that's going to be changing really soon. But until then, just keep in mind that whichever one you choose, it may or may not be supported. <clears throat> so what we've done, instead of doing a security model, is dropping capabilities and monitoring our containers, monitoring the event stream out of our containers. Um, so I have mentioned a container orchestration system. One of the things that, um, that containers have really done for us or that they've kind of lend themselves to, how many of you have ever heard of uh, Jevons Paradox? Jevons Paradox comes from the 18th, 1800s and it was a, a view of using coal. So the, the paradox was the more coal that was available, the more people used. It's kind of similar to electricity today. The more there's available, the more uses we find for it. Same thing with containers. <laughs> the easier it is to use containers, the more you containerize everything. So orchestration systems are what grew up around containers to move containers around, to start them up, to figure out scheduling. So what you have now is the concept of a meta um, operating system. 
across multiple computers. The clear winner of that right now is Kubernetes. And we're not going to delve too much into Kubernetes because that's a whole other ball of wax. Might be a next talk. But um, the orchestration systems are very opinionated. And it's worth reading what the opinions are of the people who've, who've put these systems together. Um, one of the opinions is software-defined networks, which are really interesting. Um, for example, Google treats their data centers as one black box compute um, resource. Inside of that data center, um, ad hoc networks are created using the container orchestration systems. Um, to back up a little bit more, a container is not just a process, but it also has injected in it a network driver. And so it looks to the developer as if you're getting an entire VM all of your own. And that's really attractive for, for software engineers. And because you're getting a network driver injected, that network driver could be anything. And so that's where the um, software-defined networks have come in. So it allows us to create software-defined data centers, um, which are kind of scary and also promising at the same time. Because what this means is I can shrink my application down to where um, I have this group of containers that all talk to each other but don't talk to any other containers. Um, orchestration systems default to just work. So Kubernetes does not include um, any opinions on security out of the box. You have to add that yourself. And there's a lot of places where you can. Going back to the nudge principle, they want it to just work so that people will adopt it, but we haven't, um, we haven't started nudging people to use more um, uh, secure practices. Another example of this is running your own registry, your own Docker registry, doesn't include security by default, but there's a lot of options there to allow like LDAP access and, and all that. And I neglected to mention earlier that your registry system should be separated. Allow developers to push to their own repos, to their own names, but don't allow them to push to the, um, the production repo. Gate that by Jenkins or some other build server. Um, so one thing to point out is that because orchestration systems don't have security on by default, um, it means that any node can talk to any other node in the system by default. And that's something to really pay attention to, especially on, on all the worker nodes. If you have a rogue container in there and you haven't segmented access, um, deliberately segmented access, then one bad container could just spew or talk to anything else. One thing, um, so I really want to get this term out there as far as container security, bulkheading. Um, defense in depth, if we're going to treat our container systems with the same depth of security, then we need to think about how we can um, assume that one of our containers is compromised and then how do we keep other containers from being also compromised. And that's part of the kernel capabilities, dropping that easy or dropping that early and um, a lot of it's monitoring too. So uh, tagging is the way forward. Rather than, so in, in times past, we had one computer, one VM, and we knew what it did, and we used it by name and, and stuff like that. Going forward, we're going to have containers, and, and um, how many of you have heard the term pets versus cattle when it comes to containers? Well, there's a third term, which has come out more recently, which is insects. Containers as insects doing one function, only one function, and being ephemeral. And when you have that, you can't really you can't really log and monitor things in the way that you used to do. The best way to do it, and Google does this really well, is by tagging. So this tag can talk to this other tag, but it can't talk to a, a different tag. Um, it requires us to think of components as discrete logical units. Um, and it also allows us to think like in terms of like really granular, this thing can talk to this thing on this port, but it can't reach back out or something like that. Um, yeah, containers are designed to be in motion. So if you have a container environment and you have a container that's been up for like 100 days or something like that, that's bad. You need to have something that goes out there and harvest those containers. Because a lot of things could change. 
Um, we've run into this in our cloud where uh, environment variables change and they haven't been reapplied to the new containers because the new containers haven't come up. So that when somebody does kick a container, it gets a bad value and it can't come all the way up. Um, continuously refreshing catches that early. And real quick, right before we end, this is another rabbit hole that we could go down for a long time. eBPF, I would argue, is the future of not just, um, so eBPF, extended Berkeley packet filters, you've used them, if you've used IP, um, what is it? IP filter, yeah, IP filter, then you've used eBPF. You, you don't know it, but that's what's going on behind the scenes. So extended Berkeley packet filters is an ad hoc measurement um, and limited control in kernel space. This is uh, basically byte code that gets loaded into the kernel and the kernel executes it in kernel mode that then operates on one stream of, of events, either syscalls or network. The first target was network. So um, it's effectively detraced for Linux. And this has been slowly piecemealed out into the Linux kernel for the last year or so. And the interesting thing is it hasn't gotten as much um, notoriety as it should. This is useful, so I'll skip to the end there. It's useful for evaluating both performance and security. And I think this is really fascinating because with containers, performance and security are wedded together. Down at the syscall level, down at the how you measure, how you measure like what the container's doing and how it's doing it. That means that you're, if you're selling this up the chain, you can say paying attention to our containers will make them both faster and more secure. Like adding all that stuff into the, um, like taking care of linting and all that. Because one of the questions that you'll get asked is why are we adding so many layers of indirection? Have you been asked that, Ruth? <laughs> Not directly, but that is like one of the things that, I mean, containers carry their own complexity and it, it multiplies as you keep on going. So this is one of the promises, or one of the things that you can use to, um, to show how, how the, you get better performance, you get better security out of it if you go down that path. Um, anyway, uh, so summary. Uh, securing the cloud comes to two questions to ask ourselves. What's running in our containers, or even what's loaded in our containers, what's available? And then how can we be sure our containers are behaving normally? And that goes to the monitoring part. So I, I glossed over a whole bunch of tools and a whole bunch of utilities. I highly encourage you to take a look at the awesome list that I put together. I try to keep this reasonably up to date. It contains references to tools like Claire that are able to uh, scan all the linting tools that I was talking about. Um, all of that gets put in here. How to do a pipeline build with Jenkins. Um, and use Docker containers as linters and, and all these other things. So um, with that, are there any questions? Any comments? Any, uh, yeah? Are we going to be sure of the types of stages we talked about as far as the security tools that you guys might be using? So in your pipeline, mm -hmm. stage for one or more different security checks? Yeah, so we use a lot of Go, and one of our, one of our systems that we use so we use Go Meta Linter and Hadolint. Hadolint is what we use to, it's the Docker file and inline bash linting solution, and that's a stage. And then another stage is our Go Meta Linter for our Go um, code base, because we use a lot of Go. Um, are you talking about an example of the actual Jenkins file? No. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if there was something specific that you guys are using besides that you guys are using out for the security. So, so composition or not, just like knowing that yeah. vulnerable libraries exist in this generation. So for that we use um, let's see, there was the Go Harbor. Go Harbor is what we use to do analysis of the image itself and what's in the image. And then that also scans it, it rescans it when it goes to promote to another environment. 
So, all right. Anybody else? If not, thank you guys for coming, and um, hope you have a good rest of the day.